Right, hello everybody. Um, absolutely lovely to have you here. You're extremely welcome. And today we're running an, an online workshop and the workshop title is because we hope that you will take the opportunity to put forward your ideas, your suggestions, your thoughts, your comments using your phone. So I'm a little bit like a broken record, but let's make sure that everybody gets a chance to contribute. So if you have a smartphone, please grab it now. And you can, if you open up your um, your camera and point it at the QR code that's on your screen at the moment, and some text will pop up on your mobile phone, and just click on that text, and it'll bring you to the audience um, part of this workshop. And when you get there, you can click on an emoji, and it'll come up on the screen in front of you. Just let me know that you're here. So that's lovely. Right, so today we have myself, I'm Louise, Louise Kelly, and we also have Anaj, who you'll, um, may be able to give us a wave, um, or you'll meet him in a little while anyway. And also in the background, we have Lisa and Linda, and you'll hear their voices later on. Um, <clears throat> okay, so today is all about movement and living a good life. And Movement and living a good life, it's important for all of us, for ourselves, for our families, for our older relatives, for the people experiencing care who um, are in the, who use the services that we work in. And there's so much information out there about, about what it means to have a good life and what it means to age well. And we're going to connect up with that today. And we know that you lead very busy professional and personal lives. And oftentimes, um, we, we just don't have a time to think about these these things and the uh, you know what it means to live a good life and the impact it could have on our on our work so this workshop is giving you time out of your busy lives to have a think about about these things and looking at how small changes can have a big impact a big positive impact so we're really ref giving you time to refresh what you already know hopefully learn some one or two new things and very importantly by the end that you have a plan a plan to do some to try some improvement or make one small change that will have a difference and we might have a bit of fun along the way though i'm not guaranteeing that so today is all about why should we be bothered about this and how how are we going to make some changes around the whole the topics of moving and living so why, why should we be bothered and what are we going to do about it so let's try using your phone to share your thoughts and ideas. Let's warm up those fingers. And with a bit of luck, you've joined, uh, you have this now on your um, on your phone. And if you could put in what part of the country are you calling in from? And you can you can uh, pop pop where you're calling in from. Let's see who's here today. Be really good. And again, if you've just joined us and you're not too sure what on earth is going on, if you open your smartphone, open the camera, point it at the QR code and click on the text, it'll bring you to a place where you can pop in where exactly you're calling in from. We have loads of people from Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen. Um, and then right across the country from Aberdeenshire, Glenrothes, down to Deeside, Midlothian, South Lanarkshire, Aberfeldy, um, lots of really good, a good spread right across the country. Wait, now, this this is a, a little bit um, more deep and meaningful. So think about yourself and your life, and remember it's all anonymous, and type in a couple of things that bring you joy. And maybe it might be something that gives you a sense of satisfaction or something fun you're planning soon, something that gets you up and going. We'd love to hear your feedback on, um, on the things that bring you joy. Wow, things are just flying in there. That's fantastic. Um, ooh. Gosh, lots of, lots of really good variety of things. And I'll, I'll just put up the little hints and tips as to type things. You can add in, you could add in more things if you like. What gives you a sense of satisfaction? Something you enjoyed at the weekend? 
Maybe a favorite hobby? Ooh. <laughs> Goodness me, we've got four pages full. What, what I'm seeing is there's a whole load of different things here to do with, wow, to do with um, connecting with others, like families, friends. Uh, Yep, a whole whole load of whole load of things. There's there's stuff to do with have, being in control, like payday. <laughs> um, there's people taking time to themselves. Uh, there's there's relaxing and sort of chilling in your own space. There's plenty of stuff to look forward to, like you know, going out for dinner, um, going on holidays, planning holidays, preparing for person's wedding, lots of fabulous stuff here. And then there's lots of out, uh, outdoors things, isn't it? Walking the fresh air. Um, I guess if you, you, a couple of folk there with, with, with dogs, you're going to be outdoors and going for a walk, walking my dog and so on. And in, in, in uh, a connection with things that are greater than, our, than ourselves, like worship, um, mountain climbing, <clears throat> You know, getting out in the great outdoors and planning, planning things, time to myself, times with other people. <clears throat> so let's have a look at let's keep keep going with this, because actually what you're saying makes up a great life and things that bring joy. Um, these are the things that for you just now, for me just now, this is the stuff that that brings brings joy, that brings our life meaning. And. That is so interesting because some some thoughts from people experiencing care, um, you know, when you're experiencing care in whatever way, if you're living in a care home or going to a daycare centre or whatever, or having people help you at home to, to, to stay as independent as possible at home. Older people have said that, that what's really helpful to them, what's really important to them is that support should give this purpose and meaning to life. So it's not just help to get dressed, but to get dressed to to do what? Because all of those things that you've just put up there give purpose and meaning to your life. And for people experiencing care, absolutely, it's purpose and meaning in life that they want to focus on. And that, that the help that they get from care workers, whatever, is helping them to do that. And um, yeah, that's some research from Joseph Roundtree Foundation and a little quote from Alan as well, who's saying, you know, I, I, I really want to, what can I do to help me keep me alive and to live my life no matter what age we are? And um, the same results hold true for people with learning disabilities, with autism and so on. Right. OK, so now. We know that. Um, you you know all about these impacts. You've lived through it both personally and professionally, no doubt. And um, o over a period of, of of with lockdowns and COVID nineteen and so on, you know our world's changed. Everybody's world changed, and there's been huge impacts, as we know. And here are some of the ones that that we've we've picked out from the research as to actually what's happened since since COVID nineteen. And you've you you've experienced this. Personally, no doubt, and professionally, absolutely. And you know better than most uh, these impacts. <clears throat> and one of the things we want to pick out is that that loss of confidence. And in, in doing some work with care workers, we know that uh, folk have lost the care workers. We ourselves have lost confidence. And perhaps if you think about your, your parents or your relatives, you, you may know of folk who haven't kind of got back to doing the things they used to do because they've gotten out of the way of it. And oftentimes people say, you know, it's OK, I, I, I'm fine now. I don't want to go back to that to that group I used to be involved with, that, that club or, or, you know, that, you know, I'm, I'm fine sitting here because we've we've lost confidence and we've lost abilities as well to do day to day activities. And there's been a huge increase in in terms of falls and, and anxiety and low mood. Um, <clears throat> so, this holds true for ourselves, for our relatives, and indeed for the people we're supporting. Now, um, 
this little bit of research is pre-COVID, but and we, we, we've chosen it in particular because way back when, any research that was done showed that older people were actually the most, uh, one of the most sedentary age groups. Okay, and this, you know, you might think to yourself, mm, yeah, I think that might be true because of people that you know. Um, if you're a bit older yourself, <laughs> maybe it holds true for you, or you think of your parents, your grandparents, and so on. That older people are one of the most sedentary age group, <coughs> spending, <coughs> excuse me, up to ten hours a day sitting. Wow, which is extraordinary when you think about it. that's quite a long time and the research tells us that let's have a look at some of the some of the some of the, some of the research um that uh, lack of lack of strength and 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 balance um you know contributes to many falls we, we know this and the really interesting one there is a third one along in, in the in the in the like the medium green that not moving actually causes decline. So we know that you know in order to to improve our health and well-being, we need to do more. But I think this is a, a new idea from all of the research that actually if you if you do nothing, you actually go downhill. So a lack of movement accelerates the aging process right at a cellular level. And the one at the far right, this is quite stark, isn't it? That when you uh, cease moving, that it leads to loneliness, poor sleep, loss of independence and so on, which is which is quite, quite, quite stark. And here's some more research on the same vein. Um, the one on the right about social isolation and actually Social isolation and loneliness are, are very harmful and, and damage health and well-being. And again, this is a new idea um, because lack of movement accelerates the aging process and lack of movement um, uh, leads to many of us becoming more isolated. Right now, OK, over to yourselves again and let's have a look at um, now you're you're very busy, and I know that. And having worked with 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 care staff across the country, you're incredibly busy. You have a very important job. You you you're you're busy and so on. And if I came back to you and said, do you know what? Tomorrow when you get up, rather than going to work or rather than getting on with various things in your life, I want you to sit on your sofa. I'll give you the zapper, a cup of tea, or whatever, and you can just chill there for the day. Now you probably think, oh my goodness, that's great. I can catch up in the box sets and so on. Um. However, if I said, OK, that's today, but we want you to do that tomorrow as well and the next day and the next day and the next day, you get the drift. If that was your life for the next week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, I'd love to find out how would you feel or what would the impact be if you spent most of your days just sitting down? So go and have a look at that and I'd love to to hear your ideas about that. Um, yeah, so looking at over what people have written, we have um, physical reasons um, for, sorry, physical impact on people from not being able to move. So having a lack of energy, being stiff, feeling sick, having aches and pains, um, psychological reasons as well, bored, low mood, decline in mental health, um, lack of activity, so feeling frustrated and envious of this, who, envious of those who are able to move. A great mix of reasons there that I can see. I'm just going to see if there's any other themes coming out of there. Two six. I think I've covered everything though. Uh, loss of identity and loss of purpose. Those are really important as well. Not feeling like they're fully contributing in their life or in the world. And that's a good list there of depressive symptoms as well. Tired, anxious and agitated. OK. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, um, Lisa. And oh, my goodness. And of course, you may think, well, why? Why am I asking this question? And the reason being that if folk that you're 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 caring for are spending a lot of their time sitting, 
why wouldn't we we expect these sorts of things? And Alice, do you want to hop in there in terms of how sometimes we, we manage the symptoms of people being bored, depressed, et cetera, et cetera? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and this just kind of highlights kind of the litany of damage because we have a habit of solving problems with medication. So, but you would probably all um, have seen a lot in practice is when somebody goes to uh, a doctor, when somebody's referred to a doctor with severe pain and um, low mood and um, levels of depression, they usually end up getting very strong pain relief and antidepressants. And what that mm -hmm. ends up doing is, as you all know from your own experience, that, you know, strong pain relief, antidepressants make us even more drowsy, make us even less likely to move. So we're, we actually end up trying to solve the problem by compounding the problem and create this vicious circle where the treatment, our medication is actually making us move even less. And therefore, the problem that's leading to our low mood and, and the pain is actually increasing. And unfortunately, the only release out of that vicious circle is when we have an acute event like a fall in a hospital admission or something like that. Um, and even then, it of course depends on how good support we get in hospital, whether we're getting, whether we're spending a lot of time in our bed, beds or our chairs, um, or that kind of further deepens this vicious circle of inactivity leading to inability to move and being sore and low in mood um, and continuing to have treatment that compounds the problem. Thanks so much, Anaj. OK, I'll just finish this one more and then I'll hand over to your good self now that we, we have you here in real time. Now, uh, some of you may have heard about the, the life curve, and um, this is based on research from Professor Peter Gore and colleagues down the University of Newcastle. And what's really strange and interesting is that we lose abilities in a certain order, and you can see those abilities. Hopefully, you're up there at the top there. Can you... Can you go, can you walk a mile, you know, 15, 20 minutes? Can you go hiking? Can you get up from the floor? Hopefully we can all do that. And in fact, um, <clears throat> but um, as, as we age and we start moving, we can start losing other abilities. And the, 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 we're losing the abilities because we're not using them, okay? And you can see uh, as we get down how important it is um, to, uh, keep moving, for example, to keep using steps if we want to keep using steps, keep walking up steps every day, all the time when we've given given a choice so that we're continuing to be able to walk up steps as we age. And one of them there is about um, uh, transferring from a chair, standing up. So wherever you are in the country, let's all stand up. I'm, I'm just standing up here. Let's all stand up because and um, sit down again that is so important in fact it's so important I'm going to get you to do it again wherever you are stand up and sit down again because in order to keep that ability you need to keep standing up and sitting down again and for with most of us in our lives we want to be able to keep doing as much of these as possible just until the last bit of our life where we may need care so um in our roles in the social care sector, we can help people make sure they don't go down that orange curve, so to speak, but they stay where they're at or they move up. And we have some nice um, examples of, of people moving up the life curve. And on that note, over to you, Anaj. Thank you, Louise. Um, in a minute, we're going to have a conversation, hopefully with Tam, who's hopefully joined us from Allendale House to tell us a little bit about his journey up the life curve. I'm just going to enable the cameras and mics for everyone so I can hopefully enable Tam's camera and we'll hopefully be able to hear from him. So just give me two seconds. So there we go. Here's Sarah and Tam. Um, hello, Tam. So we've got Tam, Sarah and Kelly. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing, sir? Okay. Thanks a lot for being with us today, Tam. We wanted to hopefully have your thoughts on your journey from your admission to Allendale House to what you're managing just now. And I was wondering if you could start by telling us a little bit about 
what was life like when you came in? How how were you physically physically feeling and mentally feeling like? I was a wreck. I couldn't walk. I couldn't stand. I couldn't eat. Nothing. Wow. Um, and what is life like now, Tam? Oh, life's not bad now. I've got a garage. I've got all my tools. I'm making birdhouses and flower boxes and Christmas trees and everything. Amazing. Amazing. What a massive change. How about your... So when you came, I, well, you were telling me that you, di you didn't actually speak to many folk. No. How and when did that start to change? Pardon? How did that kind of change? How did it change? How did you manage to start engaging with people? Oh, I just started to get moving. The staff helped me a lot. They kept mm. me going and looked after me. They got me up and moving. And then I discovered, I did a bit of gardening. I would bet here and there. And and a bit me air and a bit me air and, and discovered the garage next door. I had one or two tools in it, but no a lot. And they were all rusted. So I had to get stuff to clean them up and get them gone again. And then I gradually started building up tools. And then I, I nagged my hair manager enough to take me to B&Q's. And every time I mentioned B&Q's there, she goes point in the face. <laughs> She bought me a, a, a cross cut saw and I got a, a new drill and then we've got a lot of stuff donated from a neighbour, mm -hmm. tools and a lot of stuff. And then I managed to nag my care manager again for a bench saw, which I eventually got <laughs> through a little help from you. <laughs> Uh, my garage now looks like a workshop. Amazing, amazing. And so you talked about donations that you got. Tell us about donations that you've given as well, because I know you've you've given donations yourself. So tell us a little bit about the Christmas trees and what you did with the proceeds from that. Oh, the Christmas trees. They went to a charity that uh, I think gives Christmas presents to disadvantaged children. Mm -hmm. And the money went there. I think it was two hundred and fifty pounds or something made with the Christmas trees. And the money for the bird houses that I'm starting to make, that's going to go on to the charity Erskine Military Hospital. Amazing. So uh, I mean, hopefully you can hear from Tam's journey a the amount of physical transformation and the mental well-being that has changed for Tam. Um, but also, we don't stop helping the community at any age, you know. So Tam's already done this work on the Christmas trees and donated to a charity, and he's already doing more work that gives him meaning, purpose, and connections in life that he's going to donate to another charity. So we're still doing things for the community and all the benefit you get from it, Tam. So yeah, you were telling me, so tell, tell us, tell everyone about what it's like if you have to ever nip out of Allendale House when you go even to get to the shop? Well, it's uh, everybody goes to the shop, but then Morrison's now can be. <laughs> and uh, that's not what makes the Christmas trees because it's on the internet or whatever Kelly put it on. Aye. And even going down the street, if I got into, when I get in a uh, weather spoon from breakfast occasionally, folks stop and speak to you. And, uh, recognize this thought. So, and most of the folk recognize me going around in a, uh, a yellow boiler suit. <laughs> <laughs> there goes Tam. Wonderful, Tam. Uh, Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for sharing this lovely story of this massive change with a little bit of help from the lovely staff at Allendale House. And I talking about the lovely the, staff. Just remember, it's the staff that helped me. Mm -hmm. Sarah and Kelly, would you like to tell us a little bit about how was that as an experience for staff? And any final words to help Tam on his journey? 
So I think what gives us the staff motivation is actually when Tam first came into the home that actually he didn't have any motivation, couldn't walk on his own, needed a wheelchair, needed a zimmer, and actually just with a bit of support and listening to him. And then we did a wee bit of work with the main shed that gave him a bit of motivation to get interested, to actually start learning the skills that he had before. And he did have a bit of pain when he started moving about more, but actually he then was like, what else can I do? And then um, Kelly got a lot of the community involved. He then got praise from that and I think that really motivated him that he was helping other people but actually it helped him in his journey and he's now become his own person he's not somebody who just is in a care home living he can go out he can walk down to Weatherspoons for his breakfast he is part of the community um, and the staff have got a real um, fulfillment in their job from that because actually we've seen somebody on a journey that actually moving about and actually help him regain his skills that he had, not just lost. So definitely, Thank definitely you. proud of him. Thank you. It's been absolutely wonderful hearing from you guys, and I'm really, really thankful to you, Tam, for coming along. Um, we'll probably put the slides back up and we'll show you a couple of uh, photographs of Tam and his journey. Um, so as you can see in this slide, and um, when Tan came in, he was spending a lot of time in his wheelchair. And like he was saying to you that he wasn't actually um, managing to mobilize much. Um, whereas, as you can see, through his journey, he's, you know, up and about, literally up and about, going up the life curve through the through the race beds and stuff in the garden. <laughs> and we'll show you the next slide over all the things we were talking about. So so many things he's done. Like, so these Christmas trees were built from old pallets that you know were brought to Tam by a staff member, and then Tam's made them into Christmas trees that they've been able to sell. The bird boxes that are on the top left, that's his new project that he's got our skin military charity organized for, for the proceeds. You know, things he's done for Remembrance Sunday down there, the greenhouse that he built himself, and the car maintenance that he's done. So a person who's gone from being able to barely walk to the person who's developed remembered his old skill, developed a few new, doing using more and more tools, using more and more equipment. And perfect example of adding meaning, purpose, connection, movement, and fun in life. Thank, thank you so much, um, Tam and, um, and, and staff. Really appreciate your, your involvement there. Okay, well, we're going to, we're going to uh, keep moving on. And as you've heard from Tam, all the good things that can happen when we encourage folk to be a little bit more active. And the research obviously backs up Tam's experience. And there's all these wonderful things. And I really liked, you see the bottom right there about staff satisfaction? Absolutely. There's nothing like, you know, when you go home at the end of a shift or thinking, wow, I'm really supporting somebody to, to feel better about themselves, to be more active, to, to you know, uh, not to be sitting on that couch all the 10 hours a day, but being being involved and contributing in lots of different ways. So these are all of the wonderful things that happen when we focus on moving more often each day. Now, um, we wanted to show you a little film because Tam is obviously very, um, very able and a man with a plan there, as, as it said. And well, what about somebody who really <laughs> finds it very difficult Convert, do very just a tiny little bit for themselves. Is it worthwhile trying to support somebody to do a little bit more? Well, let's have a look at a story here and see what you now. think. Mm. Okay, let me We're just... over because Mag's quads um, went up. Here we go. Because Mag's quads holidays had to all go up. When Robin first came here, he was very withdrawn and quite possibly um, quite depressed as well. He was totally dependent on us and didn't manage to move his arms or his hands. And he'd lost a lot of body mass and a lot of muscle tone as well. When I first met Robin, he was working at the engineering yard in Malik. We got together in the disco, the disco days. <laughs> and that's how, you know, yeah. And then we got wed in 88. 
As a young man, he had been incredibly fit. He'd even been in the SES. So he was a very strong-minded and independent man. When he first came to us, Robin was very unable to do any activities. He was really bedbound. He was very depressed. He couldn't even speak. You can get two words out of him. I couldn't talk to him. He just, uh, I just look at you and, you know, he was like in a world of his own. Lynn introduced me to Robin and I noticed that his hands were really um, unable to hold a toothbrush. Um, so I made a, a what we call a putty handle so that he could get his hand round it to brush his teeth himself. At the time, at the very first, he was unable to lift his hand that much to get it, the toothbrush into his mouth. But over the weeks since he started, he's come on leaps and bounds, he's doing a really good job. What happens is, is the actual action of doing the toothbrushing is getting movement back into his arms. We were then encouraging Robin to hold the face cloth, you know, to um, lift his arm up. Each time he does it, it builds up that little bit more strength in his arms and increasing his independence, he has become more positive in his outlook. We managed to find out more of the things that he was interested in and we managed to get him to start coming to activities. And he quite enjoys the fact that it's an ex-army officer that's coming in and doing these um, exercises with him because he's got an affinity with that person. Robin and, and Halcyon's relationship has developed and, and has gone back to being less stressful for Halcyon um, because of the way that Robin has improved since he's been here. I noticed improvements when he started speaking a wee bit more and uh, taking notice of things a bit more and he would say, and of course I would bring the dog with me and he, that helped him as well and uh, I think he feels more secure now. He moans and groans still at times, but he used to do that anyway. <laughs>
move and groove. I quite like the idea of that. And outdoor things such as gardening, having a gardening club. Um, bowling, that might be inside, of course. Tai Chi, that's really good. So a real range of different activities that you're all doing to try and keep people fit and healthy and getting them moving around. Yeah, and things absolutely. that I think that are really important to people that maybe people had that connection with previously. So it looks like the um, interest and hobbies that people might have had previously, you know, you're trying to keep that up and keep people interested. So that's really impressive, I think, Louise. Yeah, super. And there's a nice little stuff mixed in there that that isn't necessarily um, an activity as such, but, you know, built in. People were saying, I'm sure I read somewhere, there's so much here, it's fabulous. Um, you know, w walking to the dining room, encourage, encouraging people to walk places or <clears throat> go to different places in order to have an activity or getting out to local groups. Yeah, fabulous. Oh, simple things like getting up to make their own cuppa. Yeah, so ways to uh, build in more movement in the day, which are fantastic. So I'm going to pass over to Anna, who's going to tell us about more stories of the great work that's going on. Thank you, Louise. So just showing you a few uh, images from the services we've been working with and the great example of some things that you've already shared with us that other services are doing you know so like things like getting people involved with just maintenance you know there's upscaling furniture you know things that you, we would quite often have done in the past and things that we enjoy doing you know everybody likes looking at that doing that kind of elaborate maintenance work you know small changes just you know things that will add a bit more movement, such as standing up to bake, for example, instead of sitting down. Um, we'll show you some else, as, some other ones as well. Next slide, please, Louise. You know, so these, in a sense, are things that, that were, are, are a little bit more on an individual basis, you know, but things also like just games, you know, so like uh, one of the um, daycare centers in Forfar uh, did Forfar games. So there's uh, versions of these in various settings, you know, um, a different type of Olympics, sports games and stuff. But the key is how much it helps a person see what they can do and less of what they can't do. So I can see there's a person on the top left um, with their walker. They're not thinking, I walk with a walker, I can't kick a football. All they can look at is there's a football, there's a goal, and I've got to kick it to get a goal. It is a small things when we can focus on fun and we forget about what we can't do, what we're not able to do, and think more about what we enjoy and what we can do. Uh, the one in the bottom um, is uh, Orkney doing a Hulina Hall. So that's kind of similar to, so uh, when we did the workshops there, I was talking to them about Boogie in the Bar. That's quite popular in Grampian, where a lot of services come together. So in a sense, we all need community connections and partnerships. So all the services that need partnerships come together to enrich each other's lives. So, you know, so care homes, daycare services, very sheltered housing, for example, and they would all come together in a hall where people would get to meet people they wouldn't normally meet. People would get to use their financial skills, for example, by getting a drink from the bar and things like that. And people would get to move a lot, but they were basically joining a massive party. So it's about having fun and dancing. And a lot of good physical and mental health benefits just come from that added movement, but we're not focusing on the movement, we're just focusing on having fun. So, you know, the Julian Hall is a cracking example of these principles of supporting well-being around getting, adding a bit more meaning, purpose, connections and fun in life and letting it do all the magic it does, like, like we've heard from Tam, like we've heard from, you know, Louise when she was telling you about the physical activity research. Big differences these things make. Thanks, Louise. Okay, and here's another wee, wee story about uh, Norma. And um, it, 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 these are stories that we've collected over, over the while with, with working with people like yourselves who go back and think about, do you know what, let's really find out what matters to somebody and let's support them to move as much as possible. And um, it, it, Norma had severe osteoarthritis and had a hip replacement and was keen to get back on her feet, but 
it, you know, it was very, very difficult for her. And she was just able to walk in the care home she was in, um, one and a half corridors. But what what the staff did was sit down and say, look, what, what matters to you? What is there a goal that you want to aim for? And she said, well, she really wanted to get back to be able to go for her daughter for Sunday lunch. But she couldn't because you had to get up four steps to get in, in there, you know, into, into the house. So that was her long term goal. She wanted to get up those four steps. But and, and nobody knew if she'd be able to do it or get back to doing it. But what they did was say, well, let's 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 start off. So let's build up your strength. And once again, let's ask everybody to stand up. Let's all stand up and sit down again, because, again, remember, by standing up, and sitting down, you're building your strength in your legs. You're he helping build that strength. So uh, staff encourage Norma to stand up and sit down often during the day, rather than sit down and be there for a couple of hours, to stand up, sit down and so on, to walk greater distances. And they were able to track that. And then, you know, she wasn't able to go up steps, but gradually she was able to put like one foot up on the step, take it down again, you know, practicing that idea. And then, uh, here we come. Here we are. And look at look at the smiles of the people involved. That sense of satisfaction for Norma and, of course, um, the care worker who's been helping her do that. And yes, indeed, she did get back to her daughter's um, for Sunday lunch. And she re-engaged re with things that she was interested in. She used to do art. She started off a little, a little art group in the home and so on. So it, it, it really helps to start where somebody is at and to to work away um, um, with a person to try and help them achieve their goals. And of course, all of the staff were involved. So, you know, when she was off for lunch, the domestic staff say, oh, how are you getting on? You know, because everybody was on her side to help help encourage her. Now, that's a very individual one. And we'd like to share a little a video for you where um, and again, this is this is pre COVID, but same holds true today, where um, a care home thought like, we do to encourage more movement and independence and so let's hear their story and I particularly like this because of course they they, they talk about the things that went wrong and that's life isn't it when we start to change something things generally don't go as smoothly as we hope so listen to what happened here and we'll have a look at this About six weeks ago, uh, we started changing how we do our meal times. We heard about the uh, CAPA and how we were going to try and promote some more independence. So rather than us serving all the meals and pouring tea and putting milk in cups for our residents, it would encourage them to do it for themselves. Uh, the first morning was a bit of a nightmare because nobody seemed to be very happy about it at all. Uh, most of the residents were quite willing to try it, but there were a few that were very reluctant and really not very happy at all. Uh, after a few days, this improved. They eventually started to do it for themselves, but the problem then was some of the staff. They were more reluctant and didn't like the idea at all. But eventually they've come round as well. Teapots were a wee bit of an issue. Um, the first teapot we put on was too heavy for a lot of the residents when it was full of tea. So we actually ordered and they bought smaller teapots. Well, I think it's helped with our sense of independence. It's definitely, they're more confident, it builds confidence. It's everyday things they would have done in their own house they're now doing here. You know, residents you would think could never do it and would never do it have surprised us all really recently, you know. Appetite was poor, fluid intake was poor. They're actually improved greatly. They're eating far more at the table and they're drinking far more because they can do it themselves. Quite good. Mm, afternoon tea's lovely. <laughs> oh, it's lovely. Beautiful. Well, it was. <laughs> it's lovely.
It's trial and error, re uh, really, but stick with it, you know, because it does work. It really does work. Great stuff. Fabulous. And so lovely to see people remembering and using skills that they used to used to have, because oftentimes you can still use those skills, even if you're not able to articulate uh, what you're doing or or so on. Um, now, so. Um, Anuj, over to you for the next one. Thank you, Louise. So. We wanted to speak to you about um, what care services have told us, um, things that they can sometimes find that inadvertently uh, end up end up making us um, encouraging people to be less active than they could be. So we thought we'd interact with you again and see if you can go back on your phones and tell us if one of the, these three common things, whether you feel it's an issue for your service or think about your service, not yourself. So do you think um, as a service, sometimes we tend to do too much for folk? Or sometimes we tend to do what is convenient for us. And sometimes we use language that restricts folk, you know, like you said, down Maisie, I'll get that for you. So you should be able to scale from never to always on your phone for each of these three statements. This is wonderful to see the graph changing shape um, as more yeah. and more responses come in. So we'll come to you, Lisa. What are you seeing in the graph? Yeah, I'm loving watching it rise and fall over time, but it's actually all sitting fairly close together. So if we look at um, using language that restricts people, we're kind of in the middle of that between never and always. So I think that most people have seen this happen. Doing what is convenient for us, you know, sitting, let, letting someone sit in their wheelchair for a bit longer just because it's more convenient. That's closer to the, the never side as well. And then doing too much for people, offering to get things for them. That's the one that people have seen most often. So although it's um, definitely the case that most people have seen this, it's still very much in the middle. You know, it's not extreme from one end to yeah. the other as well. So. And that's fairly representative of all the work Louis and I have been doing with care services over the last couple of years. I think the one that most staff in a workshop in person would choose the most is we do too much. And that is credit to staff recognizing that sometimes we do have a tendency to be, we, we kind of almost still equate caring with doing for. And so we end up doing more for a person than we need to. But there's a few things that, um, we can sometimes do so something for to so we thought we'll talk to you about this so you can think about it a little and see if there are minor changes you can make in your service to improve so for example one of the statements say we stop people doing a little and that is about when we are helping someone you know like uh, not giving them the opportunity to even stretch to grab their drink um, or stretch into the clothes that you're putting on them rather than pulling the clothes on so all those little opportunities for movement, so ensuring that we're not stopping people doing a little, you know, so, and things that they can do for themselves, all little things like even pulling your curtains, you know, closing your windows, thinking about those things, those little things that will just autopilot do for folk. And just try and rethink a little bit about, but can the person do this? Can the person do this with me rather than I am going to do this for them? The other one around we overuse equipment to prevent free movement. So that, that's kind of about, you know, for example, having a manual handling plan where your equipment is prescribed for your bad day. Now you might have a good day or a bad day. You might have a good time or a bad time. So a person might be say, um, have a lot more ability in the morning and they could maybe transfer with, with a Zimmer from their bed to their chair. But at night time when they're going back from the chair to their bed, they're that much more tired and they require a hoist. But if you use a hoist at morning time or at lunch time, that we are overusing equipment. You know, another example could be in a care home setting, you know, somebody being supported to the dining room uh, in a wheelchair, um, but then not being supported to transfer onto another dining chair and just being left in the wheelchair to have their meal. Um, not the ideal position, spending too long in a wheelchair and then taking that little opportunity of movement away. So just thinking about those little things are where we can sometimes overuse equipment to prevent free movement. 
We talked about what is more convenient to us. We've talked about our language. We talked about we do too much, but building design and use prevents free movements. You know, so looking at how do we use the building and and what 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 the design of the building is like. And again, being very focused on what can I change myself? So not wondering about, you know, oh, I'll have to get some senior management permission from, you know, uh, another person, but looking at what can, how can we change the use of the way we use the building? You know, can we encourage more curiosity? Can we improve signposting? Because if my corridor has character and tells me I can make a difference between one corridor to the next, then I'm more likely to go out because I feel I can find my way back into my room. If all corridors look the same, I'll likely not have interest to go out or I'll be scared of finding my way back. So thinking about those little things, can we do a little bit more signposting? Can we add a little bit more character to the walls? So the person's encouraged to look at the wall, so something that drags them out or even drags them out to the window. All those little things that make us move rather than make us sit and not want to move. Um, and you know the last one we talk about safety and well-being but actually we are causing harm now sounds like a very hard hitting statement but i'll give you a simple example so i was a care home manager before and we thought we ran a cracking care home but the first thing we did when somebody had a fall was we put a telecare assisted pad under them so every time the um, person would go to stand up the pad would beep and we'd make sure that the person's safe but what that translated into us going to the person going, Jim, sit down, you're going to have a fall. So Jim learns over time that, you know, standing up, doing that is not a good thing. Being on his feet is not a good thing. He starts, as, as you heard the research from uh, Luis, you start to lose your physical ability, you lose your balance, you lose your strength in your legs. One day Jim's cognitions progressed and now Jim is thinking he's 25 years old and you're one minute too late. So Jim stands up and goes down in a heap because he no longer has any strength or balance in his legs to sustain him. And so that likely leads to a much severe, more severe injury. So, and you know, but we did that all the time and we thought we were being safe, but what we're actually doing is making Jim weaker and causing harm. Now, I'm not saying here, let's stop using our telecare assistive equipment. It's about making sure we're also giving people the opportunity to move, to use, use their limbs, to use their strength, to keep building that strength and the balance, you know, like you heard from Tam and his journey, because if we don't do that side of it, we are only creating a person perfect for a fall, if that makes any sense. Thanks, Luis. So going to a few benefits of being involved in your own care. So we talked, you know, we've talked a little bit about what we can do as care services, but just little things, what we can do for ourselves. What happens when you do a little bit for yourself? Um, it means you're thriving, not just surviving. It's a little bit inappropriate. When I can do more for myself, suddenly I am more independent, which makes me more confident, makes me think better of myself. I feel less of a burden. Also gives me a sense of control though, because if you wash me, we go at your pace. If I wash me, we go at my pace. You know, so I have my time, my ability to take care of my own health and feel the owner of my own life. Small things, big difference. Thanks, Louise. Great, thanks, Anish. Right, now, what we're going to do now is because I was saying at the beginning that we're, we, we want to plan. So we've done a lot about actually this is really important to help people keep as independent as possible, to keep moving as much as possible, to do as much as they can for themselves in small ways. And most care services will help people to get washed and dressed. So what I'd like you to do is think of somebody that you know that you support. Think, think of them just now and think about what ideas do you have to help them to do as much as they can for themselves when you help them to get washed and dressed? And I know you'll be already doing this in lots and lots of different ways, but let's gather them all together here um, on this slide. Um, so think of the person and remember, it can be small things. It can be big things. It can be, as Anna was saying, opening up the curtains. It can be, you know, if somebody's able to just wash half their face with the flannel that they wash half their place of the flannel. Um, so let's really uh, dig down into some of the excellent work that people are doing. Let's share some, some great practice. Um, and if you already do this quite often, um, think about what, you know, if, if you were able to help somebody to do even a little bit more for themselves, what, what would that be? And think of somebody that you, you, you know in, in person. Oh, lots of great ideas here.
I think this is back to yourself, Linda, is it? There's loads of fantastic ideas. OK, <clears throat> thanks, Louise. There's certainly a lot of information going into this slide. Um, and again, very much encouraging people to do things for, for themselves um, and encouraging independence and, and all sorts of um, ideas for, for being washed and dressed from, you know, people being able to choose what they want to wear um, and not being done for them. And I think it's important. I mean, someone's got there. It's really about asking people what they want to do and encouraging them to do as much for themselves as possible to try and keep as much independence as they can. And I think you've captured all that in, in, in some of the comments that you've made. Yeah, and I'm sure there'll be ideas here that you may not have thought of, but you can you can pick from ideas that other people have had or are using in, in different in different services. And that's one of the beauties of, of coming together to share good ideas, good practice, good things that people are doing across, you know, across Scotland. There's always something that we can learn from each other, which is fabulous. Let me just go to the last page. Yeah, great. I think it's good as well that people have commented about, you know, helping people to put makeup on and it really personalises somebody, doesn't it? You know, because I remember being in a care home and one lady who really loved having a makeup on and her and lipstick on every day and staff you know, made sure that that happened. So it's what's meaningful to the person and encouraging them to to keep that independence as much as possible. So I think there's some really great ideas in that. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Linda. And in terms of those that, um, you know, that's obviously a very meaningful connection to that particular person you're talking about and, and makeup and their presentation to the world and how important that is. And um, there's you know, it's very much about the connection that matters to people as well, that connection with other people or with situations, what, what brings value and meaning to life. Just like we talked about at the beginning of our workshop, where you put together all the things that give you value and meaning to life. Um, and that can be engaging with other people or with the environment or the surroundings or, or whatever it is. And um, uh, I was chatting with Asma, who worked in South Lanarkshire there this week. And she uh, was saying, like, pe people in the, in the service where she was working were quite often quite a few people who weren't interested in the in the organised activities or or so on like that. So she spent a lot of time for the people, perhaps people who had dementia and who weren't able to tell her, digging back and chatting to their family and friends and, you know, noticing what. What the person was interested in and she noticed that whenever there were fresh flowers in the place that one particular woman was you know would really go over and look at them and she thought oh, that's, that's really interesting and anyway to make a long story short she found a, a local flower arranging group and she accompanied um this woman to the flower arranging group and she was thinking gosh she's very unlikely to be able to give us three hours long to sit for this amount of time and Asma herself was getting a bit bored after an hour or so, but the, but the woman was just transfixed because it turned out that she'd been a florist, in, you know, in a previous life. And in focusing on what that what that person was interested in, it really absolutely was a fantastic connection for her to something that she used to do, um, skills that she had, and connecting up with people who were interested in the same thing. And now she goes back every month and folk you know give her flowers to bring home are very pleased to her uh, she's become part of the group and her 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 daughter was just ex uh, amazed that she was able to take on uh, doing this because they thought those those days were sort of lost to her um because of her health and uh, and so on so that connection of getting getting to know people individually and what really floats their boat is really, really important. And of course, we all like doing the things that matter to us and, and showing people who we are. Um, and we, we want to feel good about ourselves. So I can imagine that woman's feeling pretty good about herself, being in that circumstance and having the connection with people who are interested in the same thing that she does. And the research does tell us that 
we we value the same sort of things that we need opportunities to show others who we are and to feel good about ourselves. Um, and um, I like this picture. It's a bit of a bit of a hazy one, uh, but up in Aberdeenshire and Durnhamite, where um, you, you see three people digging a hole and planting some planting a tree. And you know, looking at it, we can't tell who who who's the resident, who's the care worker. You know, because they they they're they're equal in terms of they have a job to do and they're getting on with it and using their skills and so on. And the residents aren't sitting in the the lounge looking out at the care workers digging the hole. They're out there digging that hole, and it's a misty day. Um, but uh, you know, we all need this opportunity to get involved to to uh, not just looking at people doing things, but helping people and um, supporting people. We really value that ability. And as part and parcel of that, like how do you find out what matters to people? It's back to you, Anish. Thank you, Louise. Oh, so it's OK, Louise, we'll just go for that one. Yeah, so we thought we'll have a quick chat about how do we find out what matters to people we support? Because quite often in care services, you know, so like I always talk about when I started working in a care at home service, our care plans were this thick. When I left management of my care home, my care plans were this thick. So if a staff member has 15, 20 minutes to spend quality time doing some meaningful engagements, thinking about what can I do to add more meaning, purpose and movement in this person's life, quite often they spend most of that time pouring through the care plan to figure out what can I actually do with this person that would make a difference to their life. So we thought we'll give you a couple of simple examples. Helen Sanderson Associates are a perfect website to go into and we'll also share the link with you um, in the chat later on. Um, but they've got free templates that you can just download and start using. So we're showing you a couple of templates that, you know, I have used and other services have used and found them quite useful. So this one's just called a good day, bad day tool. And it's a simple question, simple conversation with a person around what makes a good day? What's the day to remember for you? And what's a bad day in your life here? What's a day that you're happy to forget that you're not wanting to have more of? And then just like a wee plan on what will it take to have more good days and less bad days? And similarly, the next one is called what's working, not working. And it's part of it is very similar. So the top part talks about the person. So what's working for your life and what's not working in your life? What is giving you meaning and purpose and what's not? Um, and then having that same conversation from the perspective of the family and the staff, because we quite often say, you know, Betty gets on with Jean like a house on fire, but uh, Angela can't get a single word out of her. Now, quite often it's not because Betty and Angela, um, you know, that one's a good, really good worker and one's a very really bad worker. It's probably Betty saying things that clicks um, Jean's boot and, Angela isn't. So but if they could both together sit and fill that staff portion of the what's working, not working tool, then that helps everyone in the sphere of that person working with them. And um, so we'll show you that on the next slide. So as you can see, you know, the top part, like I was saying, the person, the family, and then the staff. And the not working is as important as the what's working. You know, so like, for example, I'll give you another example. What happens when Wimbledon comes around? We're playing all the matches. We've got strawberries and cream. And how many people in the room, uh, you know, the whole care home is decorated in Wimbledon posters, but how many people in the care home actually enjoy tennis? So if it isn't something that works for them, then it's a non-authentic experience for everyone. Whereas if you made it into like a small room, which was like the tennis room or the football room or something, you could decorate it better and it could be a lot more in-person experience of going to watch a match for a person. And it, you would sneak movement in as well because they are going to the separate hall or room, a small lounge to watch the match. So thinking about the what's not working is very important because if you know what's not working, then you try and offer less of that opportunity to the person. Um, Another kind of thing thinking about is partnership working. So you do this and I'll do that, you know, so um, partnership working. Now, we're talked about doing four, where we're taking most of the person's independence away. And we talk about letting the person do things independently. But in both those situations, the power is completely in our hands because we're choosing how much to do or how much not to do for the person. But for 
relationships, developing rapport and working more and developing a relationship that gives everyone something back. Partnership working works a lot best because you are sharing the power and the relationship. You grab the mug, I'll grab the tea bags and the work will get done quicker. And, and then you're kind of building that connection with the person as well a lot better, in my opinion, rather than helping the encouraging the person to do everything for themselves. And um, it's about building that relationship. And um, along with that, thinking about adapting the task. So this is about looking at how can we make what we are doing suit the person. So if I give you a group example, so like one of our my activity coordinators used to be absolutely fantastic at this. So playing a game of Skittles, for example, so you would have the person who's a lot more able, uh, you know, walks a long distance. He might give them a heavier ball and get them to roll the ball at the Skittles from a greater distance. The person who's chair bad but has still good trunk control and can bend forward and bend back, he would get them to bend forward and roll the ball, and then he would move their wheelchair closer or further based on how easy they find to roll the ball at the Skittles. For people who couldn't even get their back off the chair, he cut a plastic drain pipe in half. So it made a gutter like you'll see in a 10-pin bowling alley, and he could hold the gutter to as far as the person could reach with the ball. So everybody was getting some movement. Nobody was being left out in the activity, and everybody got to compete for the same price. So, and all that's done by just simply adapting the task. You can do the same thing in the individual setting. So like, for example, we were earlier talking about helping someone get washed and dressed. So. If you know that Betty can get washed by herself, she has some difficulty with her balance, but she can get washed by herself if she is seated, making sure she's got an appropriate seat in the shower or you know, appropriate seat in front of the stool if she's just wanting to have a wash today, like a stool in front of the sink. And, and then you, you've given the opportunity then you can step away and let Betty wash herself because you know from that point onwards, Betty can do everything for herself. So you adapted the task to give her the maximum chance at independence to the level that she can do. So she's always getting that opportunity. So that's a couple of examples adapting the task. Next slide, please, Luis. And so, you know, so going along with that, the good, better, best forms, you know, so it's, I'll talk about the challenge skill balance first. So when we get better, when we can do more for ourselves, the challenge and activity presents has to increase at the same time. So you heard from Tam, you know, the person who went from being able to um, barely walk to now who's building bird boxes. So if you were doing the same things with Tam to encourage him to walk five steps with Tam now, that would be pointless for Tam because his ability is far too far beyond that. And so it's very important to consider as we improve the challenge that activity presents, the things you're doing with me have to increase as well in order for me to stay focused, to stay happy, to stay engaged. If the challenge is too high and I don't have the skill level, then I'll become anxious because I can't do it and you're expecting a lot out of me. Similarly, if the challenge is too low as I improve, um, then I'll get bored very easily because I have too much skill. You know, So if I can throw a ball in a basket 10 times out of 10, then that's no fun for me. I'm no longer engaged. If you make the basket smaller or the ball smaller, move the basket a bit further away, it presents me a challenge. So always think about that. So I'm giving you a simple example, but always think about improving the, trying to present somebody with the just right challenge. You know, and so good, better, best form, for example, can do the same. So when I, I should always have the basic of, I make a choice. So I should always be able to choose what I want to wear. But once I'm getting a bit better, I could probably go to the wardrobe and get my own clothes. And once I'm a bit further better, right, once I can do a bit more for myself, I might be able to get myself dressed completely and only receive a hand from you when I need it. The key there is to always work with the person, find out what they can do, give them appropriate opportunity to do more for themselves, and then increase the challenge the activity presents equally so they stay engaged. And it's you're all both in a win-win where they are doing more and more, you're doing less and less, and they are feeling a lot more in control and happy about what they're doing. Thanks, Louise. Thank you very much. Okay, now. Let's have a chat. We have one more section here about tracking improvement, and then we're going to come back to about the planning. So with tracking improvement, how do you know that the change you are making leads to an improvement for the person? And if you think back to some of the stories we heard today, uh, we saw with Robin that Halsey and his wife noticed him speaking a bit more. He started lifting his arm. There were some measurements as, as he went through. We heard from Tam that he left his room more often. He started 
you know, standing up, started walking and so on. And Norma could walk more steps. And she started able to go up one step and then two steps and so on. So these are ways about tracking um, what's actually what's happening to um, tracking the improvement as people go on. So we're just going to share a couple of ways that you might be interested in tracking. And obviously, we need to start with sort of a baseline look. Where are we starting from? So here's some questions and we can share these with you afterwards or you can. Uh, this is the well-being questionnaire about tracking progress. So let's have a look at the third one down. If you asked everybody who um, uses your service to track, you know, where would they say I go outside and spend time in the garden or park or outdoors when I want? Would they say never, rarely, sometimes, often or all the time? Um, so this will give you a baseline. Maybe you might say, well, let's let's ask people in a particular unit or um, let's ask people's families or let's ask these three people and see where they are. And what could you change to move it up a little bit? So rather than rarely, it will be, well, sometimes I do or for sometimes often. And it gives you a basis from which to build. Um, and the, we have a, an example of a sheet with, many such questions that could could be of use to you. I thought you'd like to see those. There's different ways of tracking improvement as well. Here's an example from Folk Like Yourselves. It's a little bit busy, but on the left-hand side, it's a fitness tracker. And you can see John and Tim. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And at the end of the week, totaling up how many steps, thousands of steps they had, had, had done or, or Maybe it's a particular day or whatever. So a way of tracking it, very visual as to what happens, going to clean clean my room, you know, uh, go out dancing or whatever. And you and building in lots of movement and activity into the day uh, so that the steps go up. And on the right hand side, there's an example about. Um, uh, uh, in this case, it was a cap a cat. You could have a well-being cat or whatever for or a well-being ted, teddy or whatever, where you take you take the cat or the teddy or the stuffed animal and go out and about and take photographs in different places of the stuffed animal having a bit of a laugh and having some crack out and about and around the place. And of course, that encourages uh, the person who has the teddy that particular day or week to to go places and do things in order to um, to have uh, more more experiences and moving more. And of course, you can track the different photographs, the different numbers of places that people are going. So lots of different ways to track improvement. Here's Chick from Cope Bridge. And Chick uh, used to sit all the time. And the staff came up with a fantastic idea where on the right hand side, you can see every time he stood up, he put a token into uh, a tankard, a glass tankard. So in fact, can everybody please stand up? Because once again, if at all possible, if you can encourage people to stand up, you are helping people improve their health. So I'm giving you the gift of you standing up. Hopefully there's about 100 people around the country standing up right now. You can sit down again to um, help keep your strength and maintain your strength. So, and you can you can see Chick showing us there. And he used to stand up about, I think to start it was about eight times. And oh my goodness, Wow, was that guy competitive? And he started standing up so often. It was 20, 25. 30. And in fact, of course, once he was up, he, he you know, uh, went off over to look out the window, or went off into different things. And his strength and, and improved, his abilities improved, his um, emotional well-being improved, all through having a bit of competition to get him up and going. So, some thoughts there about tracking improvement and um, have a think to yourself when we get to the planning stage, how, how might you track it? And so here we go, back to yourself, Anaj. Thank you, Louise. So just a final couple of minutes of chat from us and then I'll be over to you guys. So most importantly, when we start our improvement journey, our most important message to you would be start small, one person, one idea at a time. The key thing is, Find out what matters to the person and make a plan with them. And then everyone helps keep on track. So, you know, we all, everybody who's in the person's sphere of life, family, domestic staff, care staff, managers, everybody's sending the same message and everybody's encouraging them to achieve the goal that they've decided to achieve. And like Lewis has just said to you, think about what you're going to track, how will you know that change is actually needing to an improvement, and then 
make sure that that tracking information is being regularly completed. And then you're looking at that and figuring out, do we need to tweak what we're doing to give the person an even better chance at achieving their goal? But the biggest message is start small um, as you build towards it. And that helps you and the person who you're supporting on their journey. And some final hints and tips. So help by stealth, we mentioned that word a few times, and that's about being sneaky. Sneak movement into my day-to-day -day life. The best movement is movement that I don't know I'm doing. So think about fun. Think about simply just encouraging me to walk for my meals, to go to the dining room more often. Um, one of the services did like a buffet meal where they would just, uh, instead of just going and sitting down for your meal, you would go and go to the hatch and either make your own plate or point out what you wanted and then you would walk back to your chair. One small, a few small steps, but it sneaked a few more steps. And in fact, that service ended up finding that people had better appetite because they not only could they decide what they wanted on their plate, they could decide how much of what they wanted on their plate. So small things make a big difference. Make, create any activity into an event, you know. So instead of watching a movie in the lounge, we could go and watch the movie in the movie lounge. We could have movie group meetings where we decide what movie we're going to watch on Friday. And for all of these things, we're moving to get there. And so you're kind of sneaking movement in and fun. Just having something like balloon tennis, like other people have said before as well. Crack an example, the amount of movement you can get from the unpredictable movement of a balloon creates a lot of hilarity, but creates a lot of movement. But the person is not worrying about, I can't move there or I can't do that. They're just worrying about, I'm having fun. And while the balloon's in the air, I'm having fun. And when it's not, I'm not. So thinking about that, and like I was saying earlier, create curiosity. What makes me go out into the corridor? You know, if you move the paintings around on occasion, I'll go look for my favorite painting. You know, um, what's, you know, what's going on in the garden? Is there anything on the window? Even a stick on bird feeder, which makes me, there's more interest in my window suddenly. So I will go and look at what's happening at my window. Sneak movements and find ways to sneak movements then. Final message is think about meaningful activities, not exercise programs. So, you know, we've talked about the care about physical activity program, but the key here is meaning in life. If, if you make me do something that gives me meaning and purpose in life, then I'm enjoying the activity for what it is, not the benefit of the physical activity I'll get in the future. That's almost a side effect. And for this supporting well-being to be successful, promotion of movement and well-being needs to be a part of every discussion, every aspect of your work and every routine. You know, so whether it's staff meetings, resident meetings, relatives meetings, one-to-one -one conversation with folk, where you're trying to focus on well, what can we add to your life that you would enjoy doing and that will allow a new routine that gives you more meaning, purpose and movement in life. So that's our final messages. Now it's over to you, I think, for our final question. It is, it is. And, you know, um, we've been working with care staff such as yourself around the country over the last while, and we're never, we never take for granted the, the fantastic work that people do. And we know that um, in terms of planning and taking these messages on board and uh, using them back at, back at, back at work, that people such as yourselves, and I'm sure you will as well, are just so ingenious at what they what they what they can do. And we know that the people experiencing care where you work, they value you, they trust you, you have fantastic relationships with them, and you're the people who make such a positive difference to people's lives. So we hope as part of today's workshop that you'd have time to think about, yeah, this is really important to focus on this so important the why to focus on movement connection and doing what matters and also we're onto like the what so it's over to you because we know that you can come up with some fantastic idea that will work for you and work for somebody you support where you work so we'd like you to think about you know if there's one thing that you plan to do differently and try and be as specific as you can and that could be i'm going to spend time with mary and uh, have a chat about, you know, what, what she'd like, what, what's really important to her, what she'd like to achieve, or whatever. Or I'm going to do this specific thing or that specific thing. So over to you, where you work, uh, what's one thing that you plan to do differently? And ba based on what Anna was saying, starting small with one person, uh, one thing. We have 
um, ooh, not mention the word exercise. I love that. <laughs> and, and think about if you want to get people moving more, what, what specifically will you do? How will you do that? Try, try and think about how can you use your ingenuity? Um, somebody's going to use the bot as a good day. Ooh. I love that. Encourage people to prepare their own drinks during break time of an activity. Absolutely. And we've seen some fantastic thing. If you're organising an activity, can some of the, the folk help you set it up, put things away, spread things out, you know, um, all of that, really, really getting involved. This is great. I see somebody's going to use a putty grip like Robin's putty grip to enable Ooh. more people to take part in art, which is brilliant. Great to see a small thing like that's made a difference for someone else. Fantastic. And go to put teapots on the table and get them to help themselves. Fantastic. And you could even, you know, buy a couple of three or four different teapots and get people to try them out which ones they like, which ones pour better, you know, get people involved. Even better if somebody could go down to the shop with you. Fantastic. Woo, Ex expand our men's shed group from indoors to outdoors. Fantastic. And I'm sure the men would be really happy to choose the best shed and maybe go and have a look online or go out to B&Q. Ah, love that. Ask residents assist with tasks. <laughs> Lovely. I, I love that there's some very specific things. There's some general ideas about what people want to work on. Lots to do with e eating and drinking, isn't there? And uh, mm -hmm. different ways to encourage movement. That's lovely. Fabulous. Oh, look at that one. That's great. Ask residents if there's something they miss doing. Yeah. Encourage residents to clean dungeons. I remember visiting a care home where the domestic staff had um, gotten these small, small little brushes and used to come out after each meal and ask people would they like to help sweep, sweep around their, their, their seat, uh, which I thought was genius. And then somebody would come along with a scoop, but people again feeling they're contributing and they're helping to clear up, which is lovely. Now, we're just at the end. So thank you so much. I'll leave that up because, the, you, you know, people will want to keep adding and so on. And for anybody who 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 um, registered for this, we'll be able to send you all of this so you have all of these ideas to look at later on. So I guess... <clears throat> We've got one hand up, Louise, uh, for, uh, well, we've got Green and Maynard have had their hand up for a while, so um, can yeah. we come to you, Green and Maynard, please? Yeah, just unmute yourself. For, for everybody else, because we're quite close to the finishing time, I just want to say thank you so much for coming along. We know you're incredibly busy and it's just such a fantastic reflection on your your commitment to the people you're working with that you, you, you take this time to come along and contribute throughout. We're really appreciative of that. So, do stay on if you can. We'll have the chat with, with um, the folk with their hands up. But other than that, enjoy the rest of the day and hope hope you have a, a, a wonderful rest of day wherever you are. Thank you so much. So can Thanks, you unmute? From me. Thanks a lot for coming along. It's been a pleasure um, in spite of some of our technical issues. So Green and Maynard, are you able to unmute and speak? We'll maybe come to you, Anne. So Anne McGoldrick, because uh, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if Green are having some issues with their mic. Anne, are you able to come along and just unmute yourself and speak? Hi, um, Louise. And sorry, I can't see your name. It's Anne, um, but that's okay, Anne. Anne, hi, hi. Not, not anything about the workshop today, but. It was about the Kappa badge that I got way back on the day. I've never been able, able to upload it onto my SSC. Okay. Ah, okay. I'll tell you what, Anne, 
um, we'll come back I'll to you about that. If if um, if okay. you wouldn't mind put uh, contacting us afterwards, we'll 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 be able to help with that. Um, Anna, would you be able to put our email address in the chat yeah. in case people want to contact us? And Anne you can will always be also that. email yeah. us on the email uh, that would have given you the link for this. But I'm just yeah, going to put our email up in the chat just now, Anne. That's okay. Great. Thanks so much. That's Thank super. You. And um, Green and Manor, I think you should now be able to chat. It looks as though they're muted. Can either you or Anuj unmute? I can't do it. I've just tried to. Hmm. Yeah, I made them a presenter so that they're able to um, unmute hmm. themselves. Oh, OK, OK. But we, we'll see whether they come on after all that, <laughs> that waiting. If you're having oh, difficulty using your mic, if you put what you've got in your chat, if you're listening to us, and we'll pick it up from your question or your uh, issue from the chat. And um, I can see in the chat, Nikki, you were asking about meaningful activities, working with advanced dementia, and um, we're putting all of our previous um, webinars on 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 our hub quite soon, and we'll be sending people the links to that because we we've run a, a a webinar for working with people with advanced dementia that you might be interested in in, in looking looking at because there's some great ideas from people there. Um, Louise, so thank you for that. Green, Green and Mayner have typed their question in, so they must be having a difficulty with the mic. So they were asking if we've got any evaluation tools we can use to gauge progress. So yes, the few questions we were showing you in our presentation uh, have come from a simple ways to track progress tool that Louise and I have developed. And we will share that uh, as a part of the all the things that come from this, you know, like the YouTube recording and the slides that come to you. We'll make sure that the simple ways to track progress document comes along with it. It gives you a few ideas of how to go about tracking the progress of your supporting well-being improvement ideas. But very, very, very good question because the tracking, tracking how we're getting on is so helpful in terms of actually, is this working or is it not? Or do we need to make changes, whatever? So fabulous that that's where you're starting from. Really, really great place to be starting from. Um, OK, anybody else? If no, you have any questions, there? please just unmute and chat or raise your hand. Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> Okay, I think we're we're just about finished here. So yep. one, once again, um, from Anaj, myself, Linda, and Lisa, many many thanks for your for your continuing good work, and thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it, and um, all the best. Look out for our email with all of the connections that we've talked about and the slides and so on. So cheerio bye, and I, I have a good day.